We are here in Orange County with Melinda Livesey, and welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's talk about branding, because that's what you do, right? That's yes. your profession. Yes. So how did you get into branding, and what does that mean to you? Yeah, uh, well, the, the Cliff Note version, I worked for Oakley for on and off for about seven years. And towards the end of my time there, I was on a really small branding team, about four of us. And mm -hmm. so we worked on a lot of special projects, uh, product graphics, branding. So anything that had to do with the brand that could be in store displays, outer facades, logos, packaging, all of that. And so I got introduced to what it means to build the DNA of a brand and who they are and what they represent and how you the, the perception that a brand has to its customers. And so that's mm -hmm. where I was introduced to it. And after leaving there, I started a brand identity company. So I was doing a lot of logos, identity, um, visual. So all the visual things that go into a business. Mm -hmm. And then from there, moved into brand strategy. And so that's where I'm at now and what I do now. That's cool. That's, yeah. that's a good story. So Oakley um, reminds me of my childhood a little bit mm -hmm. because uh, one of the things I heard about Oakley when I was younger and it blew my mind about like, like what we we're going to talk about, like perception and value mm -hmm. is um, someone told me like to make us a, a pair of Oakley glasses, like 75 cents mm -hmm. and they sold them for like $75 or something crazy. Yeah. I think I was like in maybe eighth grade and I, and I, and it like blew me away that, that they could do that. And that, and that is the power of a brand, right? Like right. if you have a good brand, cause then you could see those same sunglasses in the mall in one of those little kiosks for three bucks or five bucks exactly. and the, but people like, I don't want to knock off. Right. 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 So that's the power of branding. Right. So yeah. Talk to me about perception and value. Yeah. So well, going back to your example too, you're not, when you purchase something, when any of us purchase anything, right. we're not just purchasing the product. Cause if we were, we'd all be wearing, driving no name cars and just something that would get us from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. So we're buying based off our emotions right. and, and how we want to be perceived to other people. And we're buying into value. So if a company stands for something, Oakley definitely stood for mm -hmm. many things and still does. And so the people who purchase from that company are looking for, they, they want to join something. They want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And so they feel a certain way and they feel a part of something when they buy into this product. So you're not just buying sunglasses. You're buying right. so much more, so much more. So true. It says a lot about someone kind of like what we talked about before we started the podcast about, um, you know, just personal branding. So like mm -hmm. when you wake up in the morning, you don't know, just walk outside and I mean, some people might, but <laughs> Sure. Most people yeah. like will put themselves together and they put on their personal brand, whatever it is that they think they are in their head and then walk outside and greet the public. And so everyone, I think right. from, from a standpoint of just, just day to day life, like everyone's putting out a brand. Yes. And if you care about what the perception is, you're going to put a little effort into that. So right. that leads me to talk about, you know, a lot of mortgage companies, there's a renaissance of branding, rebranding right now. There's the mortgage business over the last hundred years has been, you know, slow to kind of catch up to the new, you know, stuff that's going on. So especially with branding, I think, you know, when the crash happened in 2007, from then till about 2014, there was like not much new branding going into to the mortgage business. Mm -hmm. But um, over the last couple of years, I've seen just like, like trade shows and different things like uh, like a whole renaissance of people just completely redoing their brand and coming out with this like startup y kind of look yeah. and stuff like that. Like, yeah. what do you think's happening? And you think a lot of it has to do with social media? Like what, what's happening? Do you think in, in that like in that kind of realm, why it's why that's happening right now? Uh, that's a good idea. Well, part of it's because branding works. It gets results. Mm -hmm. So people, they probably saw the first person do it or the mm -hmm. first business do it and they were yielding a lot of results because of it. So then everyone started jumping on the bandwagon and right. think, Oh, I need to do it too. Mm -hmm. And there's something, uh, there's a, a thing about branding that if done right, it, it drills into the DNA and the core thing that makes a business or consultant or you know, solopreneur unique mm -hmm. and it rises it to the surface. And if you're able to do that successfully, then you'll be able to attract the right people. Right. And so, and then you don't have competitors because what you're doing is you're just saying, Hey, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. This is who the business is. This is how we're different than everybody else. Right. And when you are positioned correctly, so branding is a lot about positioning you in the marketplace. And that has to do with perception and how you're seen and just like, a. a 
you know, coffee is a cold brew coffee is sitting on a grocery short store shelf right. that it's positioned in a certain place next to every, everything else. Mm -hmm. And yeah, what attracts you to that one brand. Right, yeah. right. And the same thing happens with businesses. And so branding will get into the core of who they are and rise it to the surface. Hopefully it is valuable and mm -hmm. it is doing something good for other people and and so if it's an amazing business that stands for something great and has a good mission, then it's really easy to position them well. So I think what happened was it worked. <laughs> yeah. And then everyone else is like, well, then we have to do it, too, because right. we want the same results. That's good. That's good. Great answer. Um, and also, I think, you know, with there's that saying that you never get a second chance to make a first impression, right? So like if you're out there and you're trying to get business, you're a mortgage broker, you're trying to and you're competing with like the likes of Chase or City or you know, Wells, all these different, different big banks, or even like some of the big lenders, like guaranteed rate. Like these are mm -hmm. people that are spending a lot of money on marketing, a lot of money on just putting their stuff out there, you know, yeah. to differentiate yourself, you have to do something that kind of wows someone, or at least mm -hmm. like, I think, uh, one of the points you made was that people, you know, can trust somebody mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. if they feel like they, ha they care, right? Like yeah. if your branding is caring or you're, you know, that you put a lot of effort into that, then maybe that will give them a, a pre, an impression that they care or like, yeah. how does that work? Yeah. Well, you're tapping into empathy too. And just like with people, if you show me that you care and you're listening to me and you get my struggle and what mm -hmm. makes me so angry, let's say with Chase or any of the other banks that I would, was thinking about going to, you're like, oh, you actually get my struggle. That means you're probably not going to do the same thing that they were doing to me. Right. And so leading with that and understanding, and that has to do with messaging that, you know, that does play in to the look a little bit. Um, it's like looking at a person and judging them really fast. We do right. that with we, businesses. Everyone does it. Yeah. yeah. But we also, we also take in what they say and, and how are they understanding us? How are they listening to us? So a business that's able to, to tap into the problem really well, if you're, if the business is able to articulate their customers and clients problems better than the client could themselves, mm -hmm. the client's going to assume you have the answer. And that you can solve it. That's and so cool. the, so that's where the power of branding comes in and really good messaging and targeting the right person and being able to, to empathize with their problems. Right. They'll go with that person or business above even the bigger brands because right. they're, they're getting more and more distant mm -hmm. and really less big, personal. less personal. And so you just don't feel as understood by them. That's right. So how do you grow your, your business with branding? Is that... I know it's like a first impression thing, but is there a way to, well, I mean, I think with first impressions, you can grow because more people see you and they want to, mm -hmm. to use you, but is there a way to grow it with branding other than what we've already said? There, there is in this, it's a hard for a lot of people to invest in branding because the ROI is not seen till way later Right. because it, you have to then go through after brand strategy, you're most likely building out identity and messaging. And then that goes into marketing strategy and social media strategy and so on and so forth until you finally have things you can measure. Mm -hmm. Whereas that's like followers or conversion rates and sales and all that. So it's so it takes a, it's a long game. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time for it to pay off. But where, where someone I would say where it would behoove someone to invest in branding is, is if they're trying to attract a certain type of client and they're just mm -hmm. not getting it or they're, they want to charge a higher price and right. they're not attracting those people. So how I look at it is, is it's like matchmaking. So you have the brand and you have the ideal client. Mm -hmm. And if we know who the ideal client is, we can form the brand to be attractive to mm -hmm. that ideal client. Now, hopefully that brand does have some essence that would already attract the ideal client. We're right. not trying to make a fake business, right. but we're really trying to surface again, those, the unique qualities, the differentiators, so that it would be attractive to the ideal client. So if that is done really well, then it sets the stage for everything else. So then you'll have successful marketing. You'll know what things should you invest in, whether that is which platforms to invest in, whether it's to start a podcast or to do email marketing, you'll know exactly where to put your money then that will actually work for you because you know who you're talking to and you know where they hang out and you know what platforms they are on. Right. So having that done, it, it will definitely grow your business, especially if you're having a disconnect with your ideal client. It's just takes a very long time to right. see those results. And in, 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 in a time when everything is like instant, right? Like we all want instant results. It's probably tough to do it, but it's like, it's worth it, right? It's yes. like, you got to just 
pay the money, do it. Yeah. Take time, take some energy and it'll pay off later. Yeah. So a lot of um, what we're doing and kind of our ideal clients is, is like more the high end, mm -hmm. um, high end jumbo, luxury real estate, luxury mortgages, um, you know, kind of touching on what we talked about with like really making your brand stand out. Like if you're trying to track, like I think a lot of our, our brokers are saying, how can I get these jumbo loans? You know, I ask in some of the trade shows, I'm like, do you know, do you do jumbo loans? And you know, some people, well, yeah, I do jumbo loans. Some people are like, sometimes like if it falls into my lap, but mm -hmm. if you want to go out and just sort of put yourself out there and say, I'm want to do just jumbo or I want to mm -hmm. just get luxury clients. Like, Again, you probably have to rebrand, you know, what you're doing, because I don't think the mm -hmm. um, the clients that are going to be buying these nice houses are going to be looking at a company that's, you know, called like, you know, first time home buyer, you know what I mean? Or something like right. that. Like it's it's going right. to be a totally different marketing type of brand. Right. right. Yeah. You make a good point. It's like if you're if you're going to go to a gala. Mm -hmm. event would you leave on what you wore during the day at your yeah. job and then right, walk the into beach. the gala probably no. not right it's a different environment it's a different set of people different goal so the first thing would be know who you're targeting so if that is truly what they want to do and they want way more of that type of clientele and hopefully all of their clientele is that mm -hmm. then then just put on the blinders don't look at everyone else. Don't just take anything and figure out, which that's done through branding and brand strategy, figure out who it is that you're targeting, make a persona about them, make up a fake person that encompasses this lifestyle, the, the demographics, the psychographics, what do they like? How do they talk? What do they read? Mm -hmm. What are their problems? How do they describe their problems? Who are they talking to? Where do they go for their coffee? Know right. everything about them. And if you have to go out and interview people, so find people yeah. that fit in that, that you would love as your ideal client. And then I just ask some questions. Right. Offer ask to buy questions. lunch or something yeah. or coffee and yeah. then just ask them questions. And then figure if you can, even better, ask them what their number one struggle is mm -hmm. when looking for a jumbo loan without right. trying to sell them anything. This right. is strictly market research. But if you find out those things, then you can use all of that as messaging and mm -hmm. just flip it around and use it as the messaging on your site and how to attract these people. But if you don't talk their language, they're going to immediately turn away from they're you. Be like, right you're away. not you're not for me and you right. want to be for them. Right. And you want you want to show that you get them and mm -hmm. you're on their team and you can handle it. And if you you do that correctly and you position yourself in that way then those are all the people that you're going to be getting. And the ones that come in, that slip through the cracks that come in, yeah. you can refer them elsewhere. Right. And, and focus yeah. on what you do best. Like exactly. learn how to do that. If exactly. that's what you want to do. Right. Yeah. yeah. So um, kind of to use your gala um, example, when you know, you put on your best, you go out to one of these galas, uh, you kind of feel more confident when you look your best, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're, mm -hmm. you're, um, if you're rebranding, how does that, equate to building confidence because when you go deal with someone who's like maybe a rich person or high end, uh, it's not easy necessarily for some people to easily relate or to have the mm -hmm. same confidence level because they haven't done a lot. Like how, how can you build your, I mean, I know you got to start with like looking your best. You got to start with yeah. putting out your best, you know, your branding, but like how can someone build confidence with that? Yeah. I, well, going back to that whole idea of the differentiator, if you go in with a brand that is you, that's like, this is us. Like, I just feel like this is what we stand for. Mm -hmm. This is what I believe in. And it's not a facade mm -hmm. that will raise your confidence because then you're coming to the table with this other person and, and it's, it's vulnerable, right? It's, it's a very vulnerable too. thing. It's authentic. And if you're there and like, this is, this is who we are. This is what we're for. This is what I can do for you. That right there is going to immediately build your confidence. Cause you, you don't have to wear a mask. Right. You don't have to be something you're not. And so that's where, if you're able to have really good branding, you're going to feel it in your bones. You're, you can come to the table, very confident, knowing this is what I can do and who I'm for. And mm -hmm. we're going to see if we align or not. It's not right. like this dog and pony show. You don't have to show off right. or prove yourself to someone. You're just like, this is who I am. This is who the business is. And this is what we can do for you. And if not, then it wasn't an alignment. Right. And that's what I think branding is really good at is that it helps align the ideal clients and the brand. And those that right. don't align are not, you're not meant to work with them. Right. And I think I've heard some people say like, oh, it might not be a fit. 
you know, right. and that's what you're saying, like yeah. alignment and stuff. Yeah. Um, so how can you identify a customer or a borrower who isn't really committed? You know, sometimes you know, you get people that are shoppers, right? Whether it's with your type of business or with a mortgage business, you're going to have people shopping and kind of going back to what we were saying, like you just said, it's sometimes it's not a fit, but how do you help move them over from the kind of, uh, teetering or unsure to like, you know, we want to do business. Is there, is yeah. there something you can do with branding or with just in just marketing in general or yeah. just in persuasion? Yeah, there like, definitely is. Uh, there's a couple things. So one is, this is something I learned over time in developing a way to filter out those people mm -hmm. is having little steps of commitment along the way yeah, that's good. and almost like having a carrot and they're like, Ooh, this, this is interesting. Let me, mm -hmm. let me do this. Oh, let me go here. Not asking for the sale up front, like right away. Right. So leading them through a sales funnel that it, you're getting them to commit to something little by little. So for example, listening to a podcast right. from a podcast, maybe it leads them to an email list from mm -hmm. an email list. Maybe they're getting weekly emails from you about different homes or whatever it is that they're into that is, that is attracting your ideal client. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you might call them to action. Now there's some people that are very ready yep. to, they have a need. to go for it. Yeah. They're like, I got to do this and, and, cash and they'll or call you right away and right. fine. And you can provide that area for them. But for other ones, that that way of just having little commitments along the way will help people feel more trust and it will answer questions. And then you'll be able to see if someone hopped over and just booked a call with you and they just have really random questions that you can refer them back to other content that you have or somewhere else. And so right. I would say building out a marketing and sales funnel that can weed out those people, but you're not really going to know that until you have enough sales calls right. until you've get vetted through so many, like, Oh gosh, I should have asked this question in the email mm -hmm. so that they didn't get on this phone call with me. Right. So it's just getting the volume up of leads so that you can see how do you need to change your sales funnel in order to do that. Um, and there was a second question that you had asked me. Um, let's see. What was it? Uh, was it confidence or let's see. It was with the, oh, the, the sales commitment, funnel. The commitment, like yeah. how, to, yes. how to get them to move over from being kind of on the fence to yeah. saying, okay, yeah, I, like I want to use you or I want to, yeah. you know, choose you to work with. So the, I, I'm glad you, cause this was a, this was a good one. So in the sales conversation, I learned this from Jonathan Stark. So he has a podcast called the business of authority and he also mm -hmm. has a really good email list. He, he comes from the web design world okay. and web development, but still, out. same principles apply. It's consulting. So he, he has some three questions that I use in the sales call. And one is why this? So if someone comes to you asking for who, whatever it is that they're asking you for, why do you need this right now? What, hmm. why this, why not keep what you have? Why right. do you have to go in for another investment? And so you're almost getting them to make the sale. Yes. yes. So you're getting them to prove to you why it's a good idea. And so you immediately flip the script on them or hmm. instead of them trying to interview you and then why now I'm gonna take notes here. so this it's, it works <laughs> really this? well that's really good and then why why now so why not wait six months so what you're looking that's for like a takeaway kind of in a way you're almost like taking yeah. it away you're saying well why not wait exactly. six if months you're retreating yeah. but anytime you retreat people move forward and they follow right um so why why now why can't you wait six months to a year. Cause what you're doing is you're trying to uncover high risk, high value. Mm -hmm. And when you're working with jumbo loans, that's high risk, high value. But if someone's not that motivated, then they're like, well, yeah, I could wait. Anyway, yeah. I could wait like three to five years. I don't really care. It's not that big a deal. And then do you really want to work with that person? I don't it's know. It's almost the opposite of what I think people who really want to close. They're like, now, nah, wait, like, let's do this now. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to get your credit card. And they're like, whoa, right. whoa, whoa. They put, and then they tap the brakes Yes. when you want to draw them out. Right. Like yeah. you want to like, and you want to find out too, if someone's serious, if, if they're not, then you don't want to push them and, and exactly. be desperate and all that. Exactly. Yeah. So you're getting them to make the sale for themselves. Right. The other question was why me? So you okay. have, and, and what in my profession, I also say, you know, I am one of the more expensive options here. Mm -hmm. So is there a reason why you would pick me over going with a cheap freelancer or your brother or <laughs> in-house? Is yeah. there a reason why it would be a good fit for us that you see? Right. So those three questions are golden. Nice. The other one is how in, in my profession, I ask, how are we going to measure success? So mm -hmm. how do we know this is 
we're going to knock this out of the park and then you're going to be hundred percent satisfied. And then the other question that I, I feel out if it's appropriate or not to ask, but what is their three-year vision? Uh-huh. And so I asked them, and this is, um, I believe Dan Sullivan was the one that originally shared this, but he said, tell me, you know, in the next three years, we're sitting down to coffee across from each other and you are excited about what has happened both personally and professionally. Right. Can you describe what that is? And you're really happy and you're excited about it. So you're getting this person to be in the frame of mind that this has already happened. That's, and then yeah, you describe what it is. And so I've done this before. One of my clients ended up being my client. I asked him that question. He went on for 20 minutes about his vision. And I just asked more questions and clarifying and took notes and repeated back what I heard. By the end of it, he goes, I have a really good feeling about this. Let's do it. <laughs> and I didn't say anything. You didn't have to do I didn't any have closing, to sell. Yeah. I didn't have to close. And that's the best type of sale. Right. When we both are aligned, I think it it goes back to the idea of being aligned and you're helping the, you're helping that client see, is this a good fit for us? Right. And you're helping them articulate it. And then once they're able to say, <laughs> oh yeah, it is, or maybe not, yeah. then you can see. But those questions have really helped me see if someone's a good fit or not. That's good. I, it makes me think of some, some other techniques I've, I've learned, which is very, very aligned with that. And one of them is, um, I'm trying to gather my thoughts on this cause it's, it's so close. It's, it's like, you're getting them to, to speak about themselves and where they see their future. And I think a lot of, um, you know, when you, when you go to like a social situation and you see, and you start talking to people, if, if you never ask someone else about them, they'll leave that conversation with a negative feeling about mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. If, if you, if they've asked you all the questions and you've talked and talked and talked, and then at the end, if, if you've never kind of reciprocated and said, well, like, what about you? Do you have kids or do you have, you know, what do you, what do you do for fun? You know, they just mm-hmm. leave that like, God, they didn't care about me. Right. So right. when you're engaging them, asking them and they're talking and they're explaining mm-hmm. their future and their dreams, then it just naturally makes them feel some, and it, it's scientific. It's yeah. like, it literally is. So yeah. And having huge... someone that is just as excited about your goals and your vision as you are, mm-hmm. it's intoxicating. Right. It really is. If you ever have had someone be like, I am so on board with what your right. dream is and I want to help you get there and not in like right. a weird slimy way, but they actually want to stand behind what you're doing and they believe in it. Right. Like, we all want to work with people like that. So true. And we want to be understood and we want to be heard and we want to be known. And yep. that using those questions are a great way to get there. That's awesome. Wow. And repeat back what you hear. Every time you ask that question, take notes and then summarize or repeat back what they just said. That's really good. So how would you position yourself as an expert above your competition? Kind of probably what, what we just said, but yeah. like what else? Yeah. Uh, well, I always look at the competition, not as competition. I actually form strategic partners, Mm -hmm. partnerships with my so-called competitors Mm -hmm. because we all know what makes each of us unique. So if we get a client and it doesn't align, I go, you know what? I'm going to send you over to this person who looks like my competitor, but Mm -hmm. really they're not. Now, if you're competing with big companies too, that we had talked about, Mm -hmm. then I would look at them and look where the gaps are. What are they not doing for Mm -hmm. clients? How are they not serving them? And where are the gaps that you can fill? Again, finding your differentiator, finding what makes you unique and finding a unique problem that you can solve that nobody else can. And that's how you can, and I wouldn't say rise above the competition, but get your ideal client noticed because there's enough to go around. There really is. And I think when you start, when we start, look at it as like, Oh, competition. And I need to steal customers away. It's that's a scarcity mindset. And if we go into it going, everyone has their unique thing and Mm -hmm. they might be for different people, then it's less about competition and you can actually form a community. I believe in community over competition. So that's why the strategic partnerships are really big for me. And, uh, yeah, finding out what's unique about everybody. You said scarcity go into that more. Yeah. So thinking that there's only so much to go around, there's only so many customers or clients that we can have and that Mm -hmm. somebody's going to steal mine away from us instead of seeing everybody as having their own type of client that's good for them. Mm -hmm. And same with us, that there's only a type of a certain type of client that works really well with me. That's a good fit, but that there's enough, there's enough for all of us to have exactly what we need and we don't have to steal it from, from anyone. Yeah. And I think that helps you also grow and just have 
it's kind of like, you know, you, if you have two things in your hands, you can't get more. Right. But mm -hmm. if you like pass it or you give it or, you, you know, it's right. like similar to that. Um, what about differentiating yourself when trying to find new clients? For instance, like a, um, say someone's trying to get into a new sec section or new, like maybe they do like VA loans and FHA loans and uh, loans for like teachers or they have their little niche, right? They want to get into a different niche. Like one, one example comes to mind. There was someone I recently met who um, they do mostly um, divorce, like people, they, they deal mm -hmm. with people who've had divorces. So they actually started running a law firm, even though they're not, I don't think they're a lawyer, but they're mm -hmm. a loan officer. And they started working at the, law Smart. firm and now yeah they're getting all these divorce clients because because i think most of divorces they have a home that they yeah. got to deal with they either got to pay out the the um out spouse or whoever's leaving or if they got to sell that so then they can they can kind of control the funnel they can give mm -hmm. leads over to real estate agents they can give you know so it's it's like a positioning yourself into mm -hmm. something that like how can like what are some other examples that people can do like that yeah so the that was a great example and they knew their ideal client mm -hmm. and they're serving them in whatever way possible. So they're even serving them in ways that wasn't under their skill set, right? right? They had to hire other people. So that's exactly, I mean, that's a perfect example of that. Um, one of, one of my clients too, uh, they're a home builder mm -hmm. and we were discussing ways in how do we attract the younger home buyer that's very creative and yeah. doesn't want the cookie cutter Big stuff. house, McMansion, yeah. yeah. And they don't like the process either. Right. The normal open houses and things like, it's just kind of boring. So we thought, well, what are they into? They're into spoken word nights. They're into art openings. Mm -hmm. They're into live music. So, mm -hmm. and local coffee right. and food trucks and things. So what if we used the houses as venues That's cool. that are for sale, right? Yeah. So, so the house is for sale, but instead of just a normal open house, what if we had spoken word nights? Mm -hmm. What or if like we had live music? Couple right. Of, yeah. yeah. And Have you heard it so far? No, I haven't. I just heard about this. It's like a, um, secret location. And, and they're all over the world, mm -hmm. so you can find them. Like, I know there's some in Orange County, some in San Diego, and you, like, go on this app, and you, and it literally tells you, okay, on, you know, September 20th, there's Sunday nights from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock, there's going to be a concert. We're not telling you where, but it's always at, like, either a coffee shop, a house, wow. small little venues. Yeah. But, yeah, I could see that happening. In like yeah, I'm a, glad like you a, told me about that. I'm going to tell my client about yeah, that, Yeah, so far, yeah. It's, it's a, <laughs> yeah. And you can host them, too, so... You could host it in one of those yeah. little, little yeah. houses. Yeah, and we've we've hosted, I was even involved in some, we hosted a pop-up brunch too. That's cool. And we invited creatives from the area that we all knew and that we were networked with. And so then you have influencers there that post about it. So it's that new, it's the new wave of marketing and yeah. everything. But what you're doing is you're just looking at the lifestyle mm -hmm. of that ideal client and then seeing, okay, what do they need right, right. now? So in your situation, they're the example that you gave, well, they need a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And just because they're a mortgage broker didn't mean that they can't figure out a way to help them solve right. that problem. And while they're at it, they're they're going to get yeah. a client out of it, right? right? And I know Amazon does that too. They were offering, I think it was banking solutions or something like that, but it wasn't mm -hmm. that they were trying to make money off of that in right. particular. They were doing it to support the businesses so that they could offer them what their real stuff was, sure. which might be the server space, or I don't know exactly what it was, but I just remember, um, when I was on the Harvard business review, but it was that same idea. It's like, just mm -hmm. look at the client and see what all the problems are that they have a surrounding and what it is that you do that, and add yeah. value and figure out how you can add value or bring in strategic partners right. that can help add value. Like someone going through divorce, they're not thinking in their head, okay, I got to sell my house or I got to right. cash out the partner. They're thinking I need to get a divorce. Right. So like, their focus, their attention is on that problem. Mm -hmm. So if you can go and solve that problem first, then kind of as a, yes. right. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what's going to attract them in. Sure. So what's the main problem? I would say figure out who the ideal client is, but then figure out what is the first felt need, the urgent one, the right. one they have to fix now. The now need. Yeah. Fix that yep. and lead them into the funnel, into your business. Right. It's true. That goes back all the way to the Bible where like Jesus provided food, right? There you go. They all wanted to gather for there food. And it was like, then, exactly. Then, yeah. He knew the secret to success, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what's your secret to success? Oh man. 
not defining myself by my success or by my failures, because that way I'm not striving towards something I'm never going to reach. And I can just do things because I genuinely enjoy it. It's kind of like being happy in the now, being grateful, right? Like having what you, because we only have today, you know, tomorrow Mm -hmm. might not be here, but you know, I think there's a, there's a, a good balance of that. And then also saying, well, you know, having a vision for more of having a vision for future. Yeah. So there's like a good balance. You always got to be balanced. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. So be grateful for what you have today while you're striving for what's in the future. For sure. Um, I, I like to always ask um, my guests, you know, cause we all as like entrepreneurs or as just people that are striving for success uh, have failures. And sometimes we learn from our failures. Sometimes we don't. And then we got to repeat them. But is there a failure that you can remember or recall that you've learned a lot from maybe one that you would call your favorite failure? Oof. I feel like I have failures every day. <laughs> um, one that there were just in general, I, I have bombed so many sales conversations and one in particular, I didn't, I, so I, I went through the brand strategy process and I didn't give the client a heads up of what was going to happen after. So I didn't inform them of the process. And then when they were hit with a $30,000 proposal, they were (laughs) like, I didn't even know this was a part of it. I didn't know. And I realized at that moment that I didn't inform them ahead of time. (laughs) And I, there's so many things I could have communicated better. So that really is ingrained in my brain (laughs) to help someone understand the whole process and what they're getting into and really think about it from my client's perspective of what do they need to know right now? Yeah. That would be beneficial to them. Put put yourself in their shoes and just, and And not surprise them later with those kinds of things. How is it to, how can you uh, really focus yourself in the moment? Like, Cause I think a lot of salespeople and all of us just are guilty of this where we like, we're thinking of other things. Mm-hmm. We're like busy. We got this thing to do and that thing to do. Like, how can you really just focus and like do what you just said? Like put yourself in their shoes and like take a minute and like be, be present. Right. That's yeah. like something that's a skill probably. It's hard. Yeah. It's really hard. Yeah. And it has to be practiced and right. intentionally practiced. So something that helps me is repeating back what I hear. Mm-hmm. So when I ask a client something to make sure that I'm understanding it, but then also to say it again so that I remember it if, and also take notes and then to also check in to see, was that correct? And it makes me stay in the moment because mm-hmm. I can't listen and repeat back and then right. get the if okay. You're not listening, you can't I'm not repeat listening. it back. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing is being okay to walk away. Mm-hmm. So to tell yourself before you go into the meeting, if this isn't mine anyway, yeah. like I haven't even landed this yet. Right. So it's not mine to lose, but going in just like you would in a job interview, you don't need it. That there's other, just like the abundance mindset, there's other things out there that you can land. This isn't the only one right. that you're just there to see if it's a good fit. And that helps get all those worries and anxieties out of the way That's before good. that. Yeah. I like it. That's good. Um, any insight on how a mortgage broker can get more referrals? Oh, treat the clients you have really, really, really well. That's good. And my one other thing, my coach um, had mentioned to me, he said, think back at the last thing that you referred someone to. If that was a service, if that was a restaurant, whatever it was, a product you bought, then retrack your steps, retrace your steps all the way to the beginning. Mm-hmm. What got you attracted to it? Why did you purchase why did you think it was amazing? What, how did they deliver? How did they over deliver? How did they delight you so hmm. much so that you told somebody about it? Right. And so he said, trace your steps, retrace your steps, and then ask yourself, how can you do that same thing? How can hmm. you elicit those emotions from your own clients too? Right. Because you have to, to, for someone to refer, they have to be delighted. Yep. So if that is a surprise, something in your process that it's not just over delivering, over delivering is fine, mm-hmm. but it's delighting that right. make people refer. So I would say, ask yourself that first, and then you'll be able to figure it out. You might even want to Google delighted. Like what, like, what yeah. does that mean? Right. Like yeah. how we all know that what it means, like we, we all know when we feel it. Right. Yeah. And then emulate that, like just emulate that. What, like, I think of early on with Apple and iPhones and stuff, like everyone was like, so enamored by the iPhone and they would mm-hmm. tell their friends and it's like, they became like evangelists about yeah. these, these products. And, yeah. um, if you do similar things like that and you have to be, that means you have to have good quality, like with yeah. what you're doing, right. You can't just yeah. half-ass it or 
Right. And you have to have empathy. You have to know what it's like to go through the process of working with you. So the best you can, if that's asking for feedback, if that's asking someone that you know really well to give you feedback, sometimes it's really hard for us to see that Mm -hmm. and engage what someone's experience was going from working with you at the beginning all the way through the very end and what you can always refine that client experience. And when you find your sweet spot there, you're going to start getting a ton of referrals and then you have a self-feeding funnel. Mm. And so you don't have to put in as much money in marketing and advertising because people are going to start referring. So if you you're able to nail that client experience really well, then you'll get, you'll get referrals. That's good. A lot of times uh, mortgage brokers will look at, you know, different lenders and their rate sheets and they'll, you know, their fiduciary duty to the client is to make sure they give them the best rate. But then there's also the the element of quality. So, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes the best rate is going to be the most difficult experience. Right. So how do you juggle uh, being the the more like if a mortgage broker is looking at a bunch of different lenders and a bunch of rate sheets and they're like, well, this one's like, you know, really low rate. And then this one's a little higher. Like how, how can they justify going to the higher one? If they know it's better quality, if they're going to get a better service, I mean, kind of going back to what you said, like they'll get better repeat. They'll, they'll maybe, what was the word you used? Not um, f- uh, wow them, but it was uh, delight. delight. Yes. Yeah. Maybe yeah. they'll delight them because they gave them better experience. Yeah. Even though the rate was a little higher necessarily, or they could even reduce their commission to offset that rate sometimes. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So what, what would you say to someone looking to like either, should I give them the lowest rate or should I give them more quality service? Like what? Yeah. It will. And are they looking at matching them up with a quality service or them, they themselves giving quality service? Well, whatever they do, they have to also pass on to the borrower. So okay. the borrower is going to go through similar struggles if, and then they will too. If like, like, like it's like working with someone who's, you know, make maybe someone who's making videos that's like new, but mm-hmm. they're cheaper. Right. And, but so you're like looking at your company and you're like, okay, I have this budget, but maybe I should go with this person because they're cheaper and right. I'll pass that on to my client versus using this more expensive one, you know, it's like, yeah. And that's, that's going back to knowing your client too. Right. And what is the best fit? Cause some people truly their bottom line is the bottom line as in, I right. want the cheapest thing. I don't care how bad the service is. Right. They're, they're the people that have more time than money. Mm-hmm. And so in that case, cool, go with the cheaper option. But if they have less time or they have more money than they do time, then that's where they definitely want a better experience. Yeah. It goes back to kind of, like you said, knowing the need, right? The now need. Yeah. Is it a now need or is it just like, you know, cause some borrowers might be, you know, I have a 4% rate and I just want to get something in the threes. And so that person would wait. Or if there's someone that's like, I need cash out, I got to do, you know, do this, this and that. My kids are going to college. I got to put money away. Um, yeah. So going back to like really yeah. knowing your client. Yeah. That's know good. the client, know their need, but then also know their goal. Where are they headed right. to? Because when you are, when someone has price as their main uh, decision, you know, they're, they're, that's what they're looking at. The right. lowest price, it's a very short term way to look at life right. in general. And it's is important like, to give know me the that. quick and cheap. Yeah. Like you want to know that because you could be selling against yourself. Right. Right. With, yeah. You never want to just lower the price just to get the client <laughs> in. That's a whole different podcast. Right. Uh, but then, but then going over to the higher value too, that people who are well, it's an investment, it's an investment versus mm-hmm. an expense. So someone who's really penny pinching, they're looking at every single dollar that comes out of their wallet as this is an expense and it hurts. Right. And I want to make sure this hurts less. And yeah. so I want the, the price lower. Someone who is willing to pay more money, they, they're looking at everything as an investment. Right. So they're putting money in knowing I'm only putting this in, but I'm going to get so much more out of this. Right. And so they're willing to, to do that. So there's, it's a completely different mindset. And so as a consultant, you have to ask yourself what what mindset do I want to work with? But then also what mindset do I myself have? Mm-hmm. Because if I'm looking at everything as an expense in my own life and <laughs> right. my own business, right. then maybe that's why I'm getting cheaper clients. Yeah. And that goes back to being a consultant and really knowing, you know, all the training you're doing, all the things that you're doing to better yourself, to educate yourself, listening to podcasts and all that. It goes back to that and like being able to deliver that to your customer Mm -hmm. and let them know like, Hey, look, don't just look at this, Mm -hmm. look at all these different things. And this is all going to come together. Right. Yeah. Yeah, That's cool. What else? uh, Anything you want to leave with our 
Is it viewers, how do we find you if they want a brand? Like what's, what's, yeah. kind of what's, what's out there? Yeah, they can go to, I, my site is marksandmaker.com. Um, I currently work with radcat.design as their senior brand strategist. So if you need anything, go there. Um, or you can find me on Instagram, Melinda Livesey. I'm there a lot on Twitter. <laughs> awesome. And please yeah. like, share, subscribe, and go follow Melinda too. She's Thank been great. You. So, Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you guys are looking for more content like this, we have a Fun Loans YouTube channel where we give away more tips, secrets, and origination ideas. You can also email us at info at funloans.com. And if you've made it this far, I think it's safe to say you like our content. So please subscribe, share, and send us your scenarios. Let's fund loans together.